Steve Rollins, welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Afternoon, Erica. How are you? I'm doing great, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you today. And just to remind everyone, Steve's been on the podcast a few times, actually, and there's an episode I'll link in the caption below where he came on with Don Williams to talk about academic requirements for college recruiting, specifically for the Ivy League schools. And then there was another episode Steve talked about his player development philosophy and some ways to become a more technically and tactically sharp player. So be sure to check those out in the caption below. And today's episode is going to be a little bit different than those last two. We're going to talk about soccer parenting because Steve is also a soccer dad <laughs> to Gabby, who I've worked with in the past. And Steve's also had a very extensive... And, and Austin. I, I have a son too. Yeah, and a son. <laughs> <laughs> Steve is really knowledgeable on coaching. He has a wealth of experience. So Steve, just to remind the audience of your experience, who have you worked with? Where have you coached in the past? So, you know, it's been a while. So years ago, I was uh, back and forth between the States and Europe. So I was at Ajax for a little bit. I got to coach at some of the academies in Spain, north of Barcelona and stuff for a little bit when I was working out there. Um, and then when I came back to the States, my kids got to the age where they started playing more in competitive ball. And I'm not a, a big fan of parents coaching their own kids. And because I couldn't coach, I didn't feel it was right for me to coach their teams and they were playing, I had to give up coaching teams and move into the supplemental space. So for the past, I would say, eight years and stuff, I've basically run supplemental training for kids going to college. I would say 90% of the kids who run through uh, my program end up playing in college somewhere. That's anywhere from D1 to D3. I, I haven't had any JUCO or NAIA players. And up here in the Northeast, D2 is not as popular. So mostly D1 and D3 players, both male and female. And then I've worked on the, on the scouting side where, you know, I, I donate my time to kids who are looking to go through the college journey and I help them with, you know, getting in contact with coaches, writing emails, uh, editing video, um, helping them with, you know, what certain coaches are going to be looking at versus other coaches in their college journey. Awesome. So let's shift into the parenting side of things. So you're a coach and a parent, and I think a lot of parents don't really look at that time when soccer does end. They're just kind of like, oh, it's not going to happen. Like we still got a few more years and then it finally hits and you're just like, oh my gosh, like it's over. So um, maybe talk about like Gabby's journey and just looking back on the whole process, what were some th things that really stood out, some memories that you really loved and just kind of walk us through like what really mattered along the way? Yeah, so my daughter's been a competitive player throughout. She's a senior in high school now. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the time that we got to spend together was, you know, traveling to tournaments and back and forth to practice and stuff. You know, she's a senior now. She drives herself. So I'm no longer useful in that sense. But, you know, there was a lot of time that we spent together in bonding time just because of the requirements of getting her to and from a lot of places. And so I, I think it's I miss the time more than I miss the events. So that that was that's probably the one thing. And, you know, Jeff Cup this year was her last away tournament. So it was the last time that we were going to go away together for the weekend. And, you know, all of a sudden it, it came and, and struck me that, you know, hey, she's moving to a different phase in her life. And, you know, those weekend trips with dad three, four five times a year just aren't happening anymore. Yeah, it's always fun to look back on the memories, like the the travel, the car rides to games and just that bonding time with your kids. And I remember me and my mom would like sing Britney Spears in the car ride to like away tournaments, just like funny stuff like that. And you look back and it's like you don't really necessarily remember like certain wins or awards or any of that was there anything like that that stuck out or was it mainly just those memories so, so one of the things that 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 stuck out about the travel and stuff is 
you know, uh, my wife and uh, Gabby's mom has a tendency to leave sunglasses all over the place. So uh, we used to take a picture of me and her, you know, driving to a game or driving to a tournament wearing mom's sunglasses. And that was that was like our little tradition when we were alone in the car. So so that was nice. And I mean, she had some some big moments, you know, her her ECNL team went to nationals. That was that was nice to see in a in a in a, in a nice moment. Her high school team won the states, um, so that was a, a nice moment for them. So she did have some nice moments around the game itself, but I would say more than the accolades within the game, it was the relationships that she made and the relationship between us that really stood out as what made it worthwhile. Now, was it hard just like as a coach and being so knowledgeable at the game to like not be overbearing and like coach her too much? Or like, how did you manage that? So not coaching her um, was easier than not making comments about poor behavior of the adults. I think I think that was that was the one thing that, you know, I had more of a trouble doing it. Not coaching her was 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 fairly easy, right? Because, you know, she's on the field, she's playing. So you have to be, um, you know, loud and, and really inject yourself. Um, we would, you know, I, I you know I have all the video equipment because I, I coach and so I record all of my practices. So I, you know, from her, she had video in the games and, you know, occasionally she'd be like, okay, let's go over this video, especially later on in high school when she was looking for clips to send college coaches and stuff, we would go over video. But you know, coaching her was never really, really um, that difficult to stay away from. It, it was the it was the other parts where I I had more difficulty biting my tongue. Now I know you have a lot of great connections in the coaching community. Todd Bean, uh, Dan Abrahams. Was this something that you like the resources you had access to? Did you? like tell Gabby about those Did she kind of come to the decision on her own to like go to Todd's camps? Like how did that all unfold? So for better or for worse, you know, I think your kids are are a product of, of what you are and what you believe to, to a certain extent. So, you know, both Gabby and Austin, they're both very much, you know, possession type players, right? They, they're not terribly interested in dribbling the ball 40, 50 yards. They want to move it fast, one and two touch and, and you know, play. And I guess the the Dutch or the Spanish style, a lot of people would would say. So they're both very technical players. And because, you know, I believed in that, you know, they kind of believed in that too. So, you know, they got, oh, I've, probably six years now that they've been, working with Todd and and going to his camps and, and stuff like that. And they tend to lean towards people who are of that methodology and approach. And so even the coaches that they have here, you know, if they don't really believe in positional play, it kind of turns my kids off. So they're really looking at, you know, positional play methodology coaches here that are going to teach that more so than not and then you know getting hooked up with a lot of the resources that you know I've had contact with you know whether that's college coaches whether that's um you know Todd and and his supplemental training but you know that's that's generally you know where they go they don't stray too far away into what I would say like classic American methodologies although you know they, they both play here so they see it a lot now, for the parents listening who are in the thick of it, they still have a girl who is in high school or a girl in middle school. Is there anything looking back you would change or advice you would give to parents who are in the middle of all this? Yeah, I would say the relationships are more important than you think they are. And and I and I have a boy and a girl, so I say, especially on the girl side. My my daughter moved from, 
you know, a local club team that was playing like USYS and E64 and all that stuff. And she moved to an ECNL team. And when she made that move, the relationships that she had, which were very strong, never reformed with the newer team. The the new team, you know, they went to different high schools. They um, they didn't socialize together. And I think a certain level of enjoyment came out of the game making the move for exposure. And so, you know, I don't know if I would classify it as a mistake. I would classify it more as a, I probably should have looked into it more as to what the relationship effect was going to be and not just, you know, okay, she's going to move to ECNL. She's going to get exposure to a wider breadth of college coaches with less effort. I mean, you can, you know, we all know you can get in front of coaches in other ways, but, you know, as I always like to say, EC and LGA, they kind of grease the skids a bit. Wow. That's such an interesting point because a lot of parents are having their girls move to ECNL teams or maybe a higher team than they are on now, even though they're happy with the team they're on now, they have best friends. They still make that switch, especially around like age, I'd say 12 to 13 for most girls. And um, kind of like Gabby's situation, a lot of them say the same, that the friendships weren't as strong on this new team because they were chasing that exposure and being on the best team instead. So it is a hard decision to make, though, because a lot of girls do want to play in college and they think that, you know, being on ECNL is the only way or the best way to increase those chances. But then there might be those other sacrifices like the friendships. You know, it was a choice we made. You know, she did have one one girl from her older team who was a who she played with since she was four who went with her. Um, so you know, they were very good friends at the time. But you, I mean, you could tell. I mean, the the parents, the kids, they they were just not interested in the social part of the game. Like this was, you know, playing on on, on these teams or a means to an end, and that that has its drawbacks. I'm not saying that it's 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 a completely negative experience. It wasn't. You definitely give something up when you make those moves. And I don't think I understood the emotional part of it as much as I do now when I we were making the decision. And some people are totally okay with making that move and sacrificing those relationships. And I, I would say the same, like when I switched to a higher level team, like I didn't really get along or have the best of friends, but it was just two years, whatever, like get exposed, get recruited and go back to a different team. But you kind of just have to recognize it for what it is and come to that decision and, and weigh those costs and benefits. Now, I think some parents like can get disappointed or feel like this all was a waste of time and a failure if they don't play in college kind of just give your perspective on that. Yeah, so 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 my daughter, you know, she, she did very well in school and so really when she was looking at colleges, there was maybe 15-ish schools in the country that interested her between, you know, academic and 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 soccer level. So she was not the type that was, you know, hey, no matter what, I want to play soccer in college. And so as long as somebody's going to give me a roster spot, I'm willing to go. Uh, that was never her her attitude. So so that gave her a very limited, really target schools to, to go after. And, you know, for us, you know, she enjoyed her time. She made her friends. She had her relationships. And now she's at a time where, you know, she's going to transition into college, you know, she could be playing at, at the college level and, you know, then there's more relationships and more stuff and more transition to come. And she's done it once already. So she'll, she should maybe have a, an idea of how that works. But our goal with her has never been like soccer is going to get you into college and play. Soccer was an activity that she loved to do. She still does. And, you know, it'll, it'll continue into college or, or it won't. And that's fine. I would say for, for us, you know, soccer was 30% of, of what she wanted out of a college. And it, it's that other 70% that 
really narrowed down the choices of where she's she's going to play. Yeah, I think that's such a good way to look at it. And depending on like what your end goal was, if it was just that college scholarship and just playing soccer in college, then maybe some parents would be like, man, I like wasted all that time. But that's that's just not fair because there's so many other amazing benefits to playing competitively and going to tournaments and being with the team. And I'm so glad you're speaking to all that because I think people tend to lose sight of that all when they're in the midst of the recruiting process and ECNL showcases and how intense it all is. They just kind of forget, okay, well, what truly matters here? Why is this all important? Yeah. And, and, and at least for me, look, neither of my children are ever playing professional, right? They're never going to make a living playing, playing soccer. And maybe if your child is at that level, it it, it could be different. And, you know, even if, you know, uh, a soccer scholarship meant either going or not going to, to, to college, you know, I can understand, you know, a different weighting than, than, than what we had here, but that was, you know, for us, that was never the case. Right. They could pick whatever college they wanted to go to. They were academically good enough to get into those schools. So so soccer was always the icing, not the cake. And, and you know, anybody who's seen like the big cupcake craze now know that, you know, icing is important, but it's it's really not the substance. Right. And that's how we kind of, you know, looked at the experience and, and how we went through. It was the relationships. It was being well-rounded. It was being active. It's knowing to take care of your body. It's it's knowing, you know, how to be an individual in in a team setup. How to um, applaud the successes of others, not only in it for yourself. So there are lots of lessons that the game gives children as they're growing up that I think get overshadowed in this, you know, drive to you know say you know I'm going to this school or that school chasing the 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 school or or the you know division label wasn't important for us it was more what was more important was that overall well-rounded individual you know as she grows from a child into a young adult into an adult and so maybe my perspective is different than a lot but that's how we looked at it is there any advice you would just close with and and give to parents who are still going through the process of youth soccer? Yeah, so you know the advice is is don't lose track of why you're there. You, you know, I think sometimes we lose track into the the ends and and not so much the means. You know, the the more you talk about goals of college soccer and moving on and the kids moving on some of these kids get into adult conversations and uh, adult ethics really really before they're ready to and you know we just have to be aware that they're still children this is a growing process this is a process about how they can become good members of society good well-rounded individuals and that the end goal is to have a good healthy child and not necessarily where they're going to play. That's a mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> I I love that. And I'm sure a lot of parents will definitely think about what we talked about today. There's a lot to just really ponder on. And a lot of people are not really thinking about these things. And they're just getting too caught up into that end goal. And yeah, I think this is such an important conversation to have. And I do want people to follow up with you. So uh, Steve, you're mainly on Twitter, right? Yes, yeah, mainly on Twitter. Mainly okay. on Twitter. Perfect. So I will include Steve's Twitter account in the description below. So be sure to follow up with him and then also check out those past episodes on his coaching philosophy and then more of the academic side of college recruiting, which I think takes players a lot further than soccer sometimes, <laughs> especially in the real world. So that is a really important podcast to listen to. Well, Steve, thank you so much. And everyone, I'll see you on the next episode.